The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled Making the Most of Advances in Amyotrophic Lateral Sclerosis, Strategies to Improve Early Diagnosis and Maximize the Benefit of Novel Treatment Options. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash FCQ 860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Hi, and thank you for joining us for making the most of advances in amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, strategies to improve early diagnosis and maximize the benefit of novel treatment options. I'm James Berry, and I'll be presenting today along with my colleague, Sabrina Paganoni. Our goals today are to augment your understanding of the pathophysiology of ALS, to improve your ability to make earlier evidence-based diagnoses of ALS, to increase your knowledge about new and emerging disease-modifying therapies for ALS, and to equip you with the skills needed to select appropriate patients who may benefit from new ALS treatments. As I said, my name is James Berry. I'm an ALS clinician and clinical researcher at Mass General Hospital, and I'll be talking today about improving early detection and diagnosis of ALS. So ALS is a progressive neuromuscular and neurodegenerative disease that affects upper and lower motor neurons primarily. And these motor neurons are located in the, in the cortex of the brain, in the brainstem, and in the spinal cord. We don't have a cure for ALS, and it is a, a fatal disease. Uh, but as you'll hear today, we're learning um, uh, a, a lot about the diagnosis, about the pathophysiology, and about the treatment of ALS. In ALS, motor, motor neuron cell death leads to muscle weakness, which leads to progressive motor deficits and loss of motor function. Typically, uh, patients with ALS die of respiratory failure, and they survive typically three to five years after disease onset. But we see a large heterogeneity in that, with people succumbing to the disease within a year and, and about 10% living longer than 10 years. The age of onset is highly variable, anywhere from 25 or even younger up to 85 or even older. The peak is at about 65 years, and the average is around 55 years. The annual incidence is about 2 per 100,000, and the worldwide prevalence is around 5 per 100,000, with some geographic variability, uh, but not clear patterns like we see in some other neurologic diseases. Now, as we learn more about the genetics of, of ALS, we see um, we're, we're sort of recasting how we think about genetics of ALS. So we still sort of talk about sporadic ALS and familial ALS, and sporadic ALS um, are cases that, that seem to occur uh, uh, just sporadically, and they, they account for about 85% of ALS cases. Familial AL, ALS cases are those that, that seem to run in a family, and they account for about 15% of ALS cases. And as we've, uh, as we've uh, learned more about the genetics, discovered more genes uh, over time, starting with the SOD1 gene in the, mid, in the early to mid-90s, um, and, and the most common gene uh, that causes ALS, C9-ORF72, but also many, many genes along the way, and since the discovery of c 9 orf 72 we really can characterize most people who have familial forms of the disease by the genetic mutation that is causative of their disease. At the same time, we've also begun testing more people with sporadic disease for genetics, and we found that about 5% of people with uh, apparently sporadic disease uh, have an ALS-causative gene, that wasn't apparent either because of an incomplete family history or per potentially because of incomplete penetrance of um, their gene. And that's particularly known to be true for the c 9 orf 72 hexanucleotide repeat expansion uh, and something that we're, we're really continuing to understand. It may be that we changed the language we use to talk about uh, ALS and we're beginning to talk about genetic forms of ALS and non-genetic forms of ALS, but even that may be fraught as we get into more complex genetics. Uh, but at this point, clearly, We've learned a lot about causative genes. I'll talk more about how we're applying that testing in, in clinical care, uh, and it's, it's shaping the way that we think about, about the disease. Now, we've already heard about some heterogeneity in ALS, and that's not surprising given the fact that we have different genetics underlying the disease, we have different clinical presentations, that we have a very complex uh, pathophysiologic underlying mechanism for the disease and many pathways that are dysregulated. So, for example, glial dysfunction and neuroinflammation are clearly implicated. Uh, excitotoxicity, axonopathy, oxidative stress, uh, you know, also clearly implicated and even targeted with drugs. 
but we also see impaired protein homeostasis and ER stress. Um, we see mitochondrial dysfunction. We see dysregulation of vesicle transport, and that may be related to axonopathy. I think more recently, we've been focusing at the nucleus and looking at nuclear import-export, as well as um, aberrant RNA splicing and metabolism. Um, and this really takes us to one of the central mechanisms of ALS pathophysiology, which is TDP43 uh, pathology. And we've known about TDP43 pathology and the inclusion of TDP43 in stress granules uh, for about 20 years. And we've learned a lot about the dysfunction of TDP43. And it's really only more in recent years that we've been able to say that TDP43 is trapped outside of the nucleus of the cell, that its job inside the nucleus is to, as an RNA binding protein, to really shepherd splicing. And we're now finding missplicing and cryptic exons that are being, uh, that are being included uh, in the cell. Um, and that is really an active area of both pathophysiologic as well as biomarker research in the field. Now, it may be that we find cryptic exons that are biomarkers of this disease and could really lead us to uh, kind of a diagnostic biomarker, which is something that we, we don't have at the current time, but would be really valuable. Because it's important that we can diagnose ALS early and more important now than ever before, because people with ALS now have options for uh, specific clinical management through multidisciplinary care clinics, as well as disease modifying therapies that you'll hear about later in the talk from Sabrina Paganoni. It's also important that we get early diagnoses so we can include people with ALS into trials early when we think these new, new therapeutics are most likely to have uh, the maximum impact. And finally, from a human perspective, we'd like to get people to a correct diagnosis as quickly as possible so they don't uh, live in this sort of limbo of diagnoses. At this point, without uh, the benefit of, of a specific early biomarker, we're really relying on signs and symptoms and history uh, to help guide us to early diagnoses. And things that should really raise a red flag or elevate suspicion for ALS include muscle weakness, stiffness, atrophy, twitches or fasciculations, slurred speech, uh, difficulty chewing, swallowing, and, and even those in combination with some of the softer signs like weight loss, fatigue, uh, uh, or pseudobulbar affect, which can accompany some of these early symptoms in some cases. We also need a way to sort of think about the onset of the disease because it can strike in different parts of the body and also think about how, how it progresses from there. So about 70% of people present with spinal onset ALS, that is weakness in the limbs, which begins asymmetrically either in the legs or in the arms. About 25% of people begin uh, with a bulbar onset of ALS. And rarely, about 5% of the time, we see initial trunk or respiratory onset ALS. And those are some of the more challenging diagnoses to make. Once we've, uh, once we've made a diagnosis and understand where the disease began, we do use a scale called the ALS Functional Rating Scale Revised, or ALS-FRSR, uh, to sort of quantify the progression of the disease and its impact on function. And that scale is a 12-item questionnaire uh, with a scoring from 0 to 48. 48 is perfect function. Uh, 0 would be uh, the absence of function. And the four domains we think about are bulbar function, fine motor function, gross motor function, uh, and respiratory function. And we can follow the spread of the disease within that ALS FRSR over the course of the disease. But before we get to sort of following the disease using the ALS FRSR, we wanna make sure that we've made the diagnosis correctly and we've made it expeditiously. So the mainstay of the diagnostic process for um, ALS is to conduct a detailed personal history and symptom, uh, and symptom onset uh, uh, questioning. Um, we can also ask about a family history of ALS and other neuromuscular diseases. It's also important um, to, to take a history of dementia, particularly early onset dementia, looking for frontotemporal dementia, which can be caused by mutations in the C9-ORF72 uh, gene as well. Once we have a good history, we want to perform uh, really a, a, a very uh, clear neurologic examination to guide our thinking, particularly focusing on upper and lower motor neuron dysfunction, um, to both rule out other causes uh, of these symptoms, but also, um, you know, try to paint a picture of ALS if that's what we think is going on. And then we use additional tests to help rule out alternative diagnoses. So EMG and nerve conduction studies are a real mainstay in helping us make the diagnosis of ALS. And that has to be done in conjunction with MRI imaging of the neuraxis, appropriately starting with the brain, cervical spine, 
uh, thoracic spine and lumbar spine as appropriate for the onset of the disease. Muscle biopsy, I think, used to be a little more common uh, place for a diagnosis of ALS. We have to do this infrequently at this point, but there are cases uh, where we just aren't certain about the diagnosis and need to move to a muscle biopsy to ensure that we've ruled out competing diagnoses. Genetic testing, I'll talk about a little bit more. Once we've settled on a diagnosis, uh, genetic testing for ALS uh, is, is really becoming a standard of care. But there's also genetic testing for alternate diagnoses that we may entertain, uh, looking for other forms of motor neuron diseases or, or mimic conditions as well. A lumbar puncture can be helpful in ruling out um, infectious causes uh, of neurologic dysfunction and motor weakness, as well as autoimmune causes. Um, and then we look, we look to lab tests to rule out other diseases, uh, such as infectious causes like HIV, HTLV, uh, polio, or West Nile. Now, I mentioned looking for the upper and lower motor neuron signs, by, um, and I would focus here on, on saying that we want to do that by body region, uh, and I'll show the diagnostic criteria in just a moment, but we want to have a careful map of where we're seeing upper motor neuron signs and lower motor neuron signs, and especially where those overlap. So we look in the, the bulbar or cranial um, region for spastic dysarthria, laryngospasm, which we may see on exam or may, may simply be history, uh, and, and, and abnormal reflexes like a palmomental reflex or jaw jerk. And in that same region, we can look for lower motor neuron signs like uh, a flaccid dysarthria or slurring of the speech from, uh, from uh, lingual labial um, uh, weakness, uh, tongue atrophy and fasciculations, uh, and, a and a decreased soft palate elevation. In the cervical region, we're really looking for limb spasticity, hyperreflexia, and, and sort of um, you know, abnormal uh, reflexes. Uh, for upper motor neuron signs and lower motor neuron signs are really characterized by muscle weakness, atrophy, fasciculations, and in some cases, hyporeflexia. In the thoracic region, it's difficult to assess upper motor neuron signs. Of course, we can look for the loss of abdominal reflexes, but that's a really challenging uh, physical exam. Uh, it's one that we often don't do, and I think it would be hard to hang one's hat uh, on the absence of abdominal reflexes uh, to make a diagnosis of ALS. Um, we can look for things like accessory muscle uh, use with respiration or paradoxical breathing, but even fasciculations uh, across the thorax or the abdomen would help us get a sense that there's lower motor neuron dysfunction in the thoracic region. And in the lumbosacral region, again, we're looking, as far as upper motor neuron signs, we're looking for limb spasticity, hyperreflexia, abnormal uh, increased reflexes. Uh, and then for lower motor neuron signs, uh, muscle weakness, atrophy, fasciculations, and hyperreflexia. And really, it's important for us to look at where the upper and lower motor neuron signs converge in, in a single body region. Now, making the diagnosis of ALS clinically does not need to follow our very stringent research criteria, but I think our stringent research criteria do provide a framework for how to think about the diagnosis of ALS. And the most longstanding one and, and, and the most commonly used one is the ls ALS, ALS diagnostic criteria revised, and um, the, the LS score uh, criteria were set out and revised once. Now, in, in a conceptual way, what they ask us to, to, to look for is weakness, atrophy, hyperreflexia, spasticity, um, with progression over time, as well as an EMG and nerve conduction study that helps rule out other diagnoses, as well as helps give confidence to the diagnosis. And then also, the criteria ask that we use appropriate testing to rule out competing diagnoses. Now, that's a very simple framework, and I think one that we've just run through and I think makes a lot of sense for ALS. The ls score criteria goes on to be somewhat uh, complex. Now, um, the original ls score criteria had a suspected ALS category. Um, that was done away with in the revised ls score criteria. And then we're left with possible ALS, probable uh, ALS that's laboratory supported, probable ALS, and definite ALS. Without going into the details of these, what I'll say is that largely possible ALS is characterized by one body region that is bulbar, cervical, thoracic, and lumbar that uh, exhibits both lower and upper motor neuron uh, signs together. Probable ALS is two regions, and definite ALS is three regions, with probable ALS being possible ALS plus EMG uh, supportive evidence. Now, uh, all of that complexity is, is probably overkill in the clinical setting, particularly because possible ALS, probable ALS, and definite ALS are a little bit of misnomers. 
anytime somebody has a diagnosis of any of these categories of ALS by LS score L criteria, um, they have an eight, a 98 to 99 percent uh, probability of having the disease. In other words, these are very specific. And because of the complexity introduced by LS score L criteria, there's been a move afoot recently um, to simplify those criteria into a new set of criteria called the Gold Coast criteria. And this really takes a step back and says, you know, LS score L criteria. Uh, laid out a, a wonderful framework, but then got a little bit confusing in the details. And I think this is really helpful from a clinical perspective to, to look at the Gold Coast criteria, because really it's simplified to there, there must be evidence of a progressive motor impairment that was preceded by normal motor function. In other words, a new onset of, of, of motor dysfunction. Um, and that can be documented by history or by repeated examinations over time. There also must be upper and lower motor neuron dysfunction in at least one body region occurring together or lower motor neuron dysfunction in two body regions. And uh, you need to have done appropriate investigations to exclude other possible disease processes. And I think that's really simplifying our message about how do you make a diagnosis of ALS. And I think it, all, it helps us really focus in a clinical setting on sort of you know, what's important as we make these diagnoses. I mentioned before that uh, there's been a huge amount of genetic discovery in ALS and that our genetic testing guidelines are changing. We're sort of in the midst of that change. As the knowledge about um, ALS genetics has grown, genetic testing and counseling is going to become increasingly important, and we've already begun to see that over the last few years. Now, um, it is true that um, the current U.S. management guidelines for ALS don't address the issue of genetic testing, and the European Federation of Neurological Societies um, recommends genetic testing in symptomatic patients with a family history of ALS. But that's because those guidelines were written before kind of recent evolution in both therapeutic strategies and genetic understanding of ALS. So really, um, at this point, uh, people who are diagnosed with ALS should be offered routine genetic testing for ALS causative genes. And in large part, that is because we now have the emergence of gene-specific therapies, for example, tofersin, which is approved for the treatment of SOD1 um, ALS specifically. Uh, and so that, that we need to know about that in order to uh, offer people the appropriate uh, therapeutic strategies. There are also trials that are enrolling people specifically uh, based on their genetic uh, profile or whether they have a, an ALS causative gene. So I think you know this is really changing, it's really emerging, um, and I think the guidelines will catch up with what the standard practice is now. Um, the other thing to mention is that as we do more testing in people with symptomatic ALS, we are also identifying more and more families that are, um, that are, are carrying ALS causative mutations and that means there are more and more asymptomatic people who are in families where they are at risk of carrying ALS causative genes, and that puts them at high risk for the disease. And we are in a, in a time of rapid change in how we think about the ethics of testing for uh, genetics in asymptomatic uh, uh, people. There are strategies for confidential testing, which keeps that testing out of the charts. Um, but that's not always the choice that uh, people with a, people at risk of, of carrying these genes are making. And I think this is a, a really complex area that we're making strides uh, in, in understanding. It may be that we come to a place where we have preventive strategies for people who carry ALS causative mutations. And so this is re it's really important that we stay uh, active in, in thinking through this in conjunction with genetic counselors, uh, at, as well as with people uh, from these families themselves. So I want to present a, a, a case here. We'll, we'll call our, our patient Nancy. Uh, Nancy is a 59-year-old woman with 16 years of education who presented for a new patient visit. She's been experiencing a painless distal right leg weakness for the past six months. Um, on questioning, she denied any lower back pain, radiating leg pain, numbness, or tingling sensations, and she didn't have speech, swallowing, breathing difficulties, or weakness in, all, in her other extremities, all really important uh, um, facts to sort of lay out in the history. On exam, she has a right foot dorsiflexion and plantar flexion weakness, about three out of five uh, strength. She has also hyperreflexia in the bilateral lower extremities um, at the patella, 
uh, normal reflexes at the ankle, but she does have a, bi a bilaterally positive Babinski sign. The workup for ALS mimics um, is, is negative, and there's a, a long list here. So we look for uh, neuromuscular junction, dysfunction, uh, for autoimmune uh, diseases, infectious diseases, um, uh, as well as a number of other uh, neuropathies, uh, uh, deficiencies, or, or excesses of, of heavy metals, um, and, and celiac disease. All of these were, were normal or negative. And then electrophysiologic testing revealed ongoing uh, denervation changes characterized specifically by fasciculation potentials and fibrillation potentials uh, and uh, what might be called chronic neuropathic changes that, that is motor unit potential remodeling in the thoracic and lumbar lumbosacral regions. And the study did not show a demyelinating motor neuropathy on nerve conduction studies. MRI of the thoracic spine was normal, but the MRI of the lumbar spine showed some spinal canal stenosis at L3-4 and L4-5 with moderate neuroforaminal stenosis at L3-4 and L4-5. So um, Nancy presented with um, six months of this pain, painless distal left leg weakness. Um, and to summarize her clinical exam findings, we found upper motor neuron signs in the lumbosacral region overlapping with lower motor neuron signs in the lumbosacral region as well. Her ele electrodiagnostic findings showed um, abnormalities in both the thoracic and lumbosacral regions with the absence of a demyelinating motor neuropathy, which rules out multifocal motor neuropathy or even something like an a AMAN or, or a CIDP with uh, mostly motor findings. Her MRI findings do show um, some abnormalities in the lumbar spine, and this is really common in clinical practice that we're, um, you know, we're confronted with some abnormalities. It's very uncommon that people have no disc bulges or narrowings anywhere in, in their MRI of the spine. Um, but in this case, it didn't look like these were severe enough that they would be causing really the remarkable weakness that she was experiencing in her distal limb. Um, and the labs ruled out um, any ALS disease mimic. So we have to ask ourselves, can this person be diagnosed with ALS at this time? If we go back to our framework of making a diagnosis, either ls Correll or more simply, uh, the Gold Coast criteria, we see these overlapping upper and lower motor neuron signs, and we've ruled out other diagnoses, and e EMG actually even supports our diagnosis. So I think we can make a diagnosis of, of ALS at this time. One other thing I'll point out is that when the disease begins in the limbs, it tends to begin asymmetrically as we see in this patient. So that's, you know, I think another tip off um, that, that um, is important for us to, to take into consideration. Um, other things that we could ask at the time of diagnosis is, you know, about weight loss and fatigue um, and, and those things. Some, we sometimes see that those kind of bolster our, our um, understanding of the disease and are bothersome to patients and, and something we might want to treat. So um, having made the diagnosis, we then go on to think about uh, the first steps um, and what we, how to manage this, uh, this patient, uh, and we could send genetic testing, and in this case, genetic testing was negative for all the known ALS-causative genes. So with that, we sort of are going to move on from the diagnostic portion of, of this talk into the really important um, uh, uh, therapeutic portion of the talk, and I'm going to hand over to Dr. Sabrina Paganoni from here. Thank you. Um, this is Sabrina Paganoni, and I'm, an, I'm delighted to be here today with all of you to talk about novel treatments for ALS. I am a physician, an investigator, and I work on ALS drug development at the Massachusetts General Hospital. This is a very exciting time in ALS care and research because we have seen the development of new drugs for this disease. These drugs are best uh, prescribed in the context of multidisciplinary care. Multidisciplinary care is our foundation. We know from research that people living with ALS who receive care in a multidisciplinary setting have better outcomes, which is so important to, to share with the entire community so that all patients can have the best care. Multidisciplinary care involves many aspects, so we're going to start with the basics here and, and continue to build during this presentation. First of all, it's important to consider all aspects of the disease uh, from the very beginning, from the time of diagnosis and really uh, 
sharing difficult conversations in a way that's positive and proactive can really make a difference for people who are receiving uh, these, these life-changing diagnoses. And we want to start multidisciplinary care right away. We know that that can be complex and may need to change and adapt as the disease progresses, but it's important that we provide a variety of supportive um, options to our patients, their caregivers, their families. There's a number of symptoms that are due to ALS, uh, whether directly or indirectly. And for many of them, there are many drugs or other interventions available. As an example, the disease can, um, can lead to a variety of symptoms such as pseudobulbar affect, which can be effectively treated with the combination of dextrometorphan and kidding. Many patients uh, may develop dysphagia over time, and that can be uh, addressed with uh, speech and language pathology interventions and, when needed, um, feeding tubes. There are uh, other aspects of the disease, including sialuria, cramps, um, or uh, um, respiratory insufficiency or spasticity, all can be addressed by specific medications. And you see a, a, a diagram, a schematic representation of how the disease can uh, really affect the entire body. But again, there's many interventions that can be uh, provided to our patients for optimal uh, quality of life and function. Areas of focus include, obviously, respiratory support, including the provision of non-invasive ventilation when needed, as well as nutritional support uh, and up to um, the need for feeding tubes. All of this is important and continues to change as the disease progresses. And I want to emphasize that patients can present to us with very different phenotypes. So uh, the, the physician needs to adapt to the presentation uh, of the patient and, uh, it, and its evolution over time. Disease-modifying medications are part of this multidisciplinary approach, but they're not the only aspect. Uh, they, they are best uh, prescribed, again, in the context of uh, supportive care and symptom management. The multidisciplinary care team uh, can uh, provide um, its care both in person and at times using technological tools such as telehealth or telemedicine. And we've been using these methods uh, quite successfully uh, over the last few years, uh, even before the pandemic. And certainly during the pandemic, um, these new tools have become uh, more common and, and more broadly used. And so the, the field is still uh, working towards uh, optimizing um, how to alternate or, or coordinate uh, in-person visits with telehealth and all of these provides the best uh, possible approach for patients whose disease may, uh, may keep them away from the clinic at times. Uh, but again, we can be present via telehealth. Obviously, because of the variety of symptoms that, um, that are due to ALS, uh, for, for this reason, because it's so uh, multifaceted and can be very different from patient to patient, we need to involve several specialties. And I know that this slide can be a little bit overwhelming because uh, several specialties are mentioned here, from neurology to physiatry, uh, from physical therapy to occupational therapy. Uh, we oftentimes involve um, other specialties, whether it's pulmonary or palliative care medicine, uh, even pain medicine. But all of this can be coordinated in the setting of a multidisciplinary ALS clinic. We certainly recommend considering early referral to multidisciplinary ALS clinics where all of these different supportive services and multi-specialty care can be coordinated. Um, uh, sometimes patients live far away from a dedicated ALS clinic, and we often work in conjunction with local physicians to organize multidisciplinary care with a combination of care in, um, in, a, in a big center where a dedicated ALS clinic is available, but also in conjunction with local resources. In addition to supportive care and symptom management, we now have uh, more than one uh, FDA-approved ALS medication. And the slide here summarizes what we have right now. Uh, and I want to pause a second here because uh, just a few years ago, we only had one medication, and now we have four. Uh, 
four FDA approved medications for ALS that have evidence suggesting that they can modify the disease and, and lead to better outcomes. So it, it's very important for you know, muscular specialties, specialists to be uh, familiar with all these drugs and also, again, refer to specialized ALS clinics uh, to help with uh, prescriptions and management. So the first three drugs, Riluzol, Edarvon, and sodium phenylbutyrate and or orsodiol are approved for all forms of ALS. The fourth drug, Tofersen, is approved for people uh, who carry a genetic mutation in the SOD1 gene. And that's responsible for about 2% of um, all cases of ALS. Each drug is different. Uh, the, the different drugs, we'll, we'll review them in a second, but they all work through different mechanisms. They can be given as a combination or as a cocktail. The first three drugs are all given by mouth or by feeding tube, if needed. And uh, the first one instead is, is provided uh, via intrathecal injections. So let's review them one by one. So Riluzol is the medication that um, most of you may be familiar with. It's the first disease-modifying treatment uh, that's been approved for ALS in 1995. And for a very long time, this was the only drug that was available for ALS. It, it's given by mouth. It can be given via feeding tube. It's expected to work by blocking the release of glutamate, and it can also modulate sodium channels. Uh, the initial trials that led to the approval of Riluzol were done in the 90s. At the time, the primary outcome in ALS trials was typically uh, survival. And so in the trial that led to the approval of Riluzol, it was shown that treatment with this drug extended survival by only a few months, two to three months. Now, since then, there's been more studies looking at um, real-world evidence that have suggested perhaps the real result can have a little bit more of a survival effect, perhaps on the order of a few months. Um, regardless, uh, this is again uh, the, the sort of the, the first drug that was approved for ALS, and that's the one that's uh, been used the most um, around the world. It's available in several countries. It's fairly safe, um, fairly easy to use, and generally well tolerated. Um, on occasion, we see that patients may develop fatigue, um, and they can also have um, increases in their liver function tests. These only occur in a minority of patients, but because of this possibility, we do routinely monitor liver function tests in patients taking Riluzol, um, and, and most practitioners will monitor liver function tests once a month for the first three months of treatment. And then after that, assuming that there's no concerns, um, liver function tests can be uh, monitored every, um, about every quarter. And uh, it's okay if, uh, if AST or ALT levels increase slightly, for example, to two or three times the upper, liver on, uh, upper limit of normal. But obviously, if they continue to rise or uh, become um, exceedingly elevated, uh, one will have to um, perhaps uh, uh, stop the drug and, and consider rechallenging it at a different time or stop the drug altogether. Riluzol uh, is uh, available in different formulations, including the tablet, oral suspension, which is uh, a more recent um, formulation, as well as oral film, again, also a, a more recent uh, formulation. For many years, Riluzol was the only drug approved for ALS, and that changed uh, when uh, Edarvon was approved in 2017. And when I uh, share the dates of approval, uh, I'm here using the uh, dates of FDA approval. Uh, it was actually approved um, earlier uh, in Japan and, and some other countries. And um, today, the drug is available in some countries, but not all countries. And so, um, and we can discuss that later in the Q&A uh, part of the, of, the, of the talk, but uh, there's clearly, there are clearly some differences uh, when you look at different countries in terms of availability of the newer medications due to differences in the regulatory landscape. But Edarvon is available in the U.S. as well as other countries. As I said earlier, it was approved in 2017. That was actually uh, the intravenous uh, formulation, which required uh, a number of intravenous infusions, uh, which was somewhat burdensome for the patient. Fortunately, an oral suspension formulation was approved uh, in 2022, 
and, and that can be given uh, by mouth, but also via feeding tube. So it's uh, much easier to use. Edarabon was approved based on an efficacy trial, a phase three trial, where the intravenous formulation was shown to slow the loss of physical function by about 33% compared with placebo over six months. The trial involved um, a, a population uh, with certain clinical characteristics that was predicted to uh, progress at a relatively faster pace, and all trial participants were also taking Riluzol. So this was um, tested essentially as an add-on treatment to Riluzol. There are other ed uh, studies that are ongoing, uh, trying to um, look at other asp aspects of Edarovon uh, use, uh, and we have um, a European trial that's also ongoing and will um, is expected to read out in 2024. So that will impact availability of Edarovon in other regions as well. Overall, Edarovon is well tolerated. There are only minor side effects that are described in the label, including bruising, gain disturbances, and some headaches, um, which were seen in the trial. Another drug that was recently approved for the treatment of all forms of ALS is sodium phenylbutyrate enter or sodial. This is actually a combination of two drugs, uh, sodium phenylbutyrate, also known as PB, enter or sodial, also known as TERSO. That's why um, here um, we show the acronym uh, PB TERSO, but also some of you may have heard about this drug with um, the name uh, AMX35 because that was the original name um, in, in the trial. This drug is administered orally, uh, but can also be given via feeding tube. It was approved for the treatment of ALS in 2022 in both the US and Canada. It has a different mechanism of action compared to the previous drugs. Uh, and again, it's a combination of two drugs that are thought to uh, target endoplasmic reticulum stress and also mitochondria-mediated mitochondria apoptosis. The drug was approved in the US and Canada based on the results of the phase two center trial. And in that trial, the drug was associated with slowing of functional decline over six months, and also with longer survival when trial participants were followed long-term, about a, um, five months uh, longer uh, in terms of survival. The drug is also being tested in another clinical trial, a phase three clinical trial called Phoenix, that trial is ongoing, mostly in Europe, uh, and top line results are expected in 2024. Uh, and and that the results of that trial will impact availability of the drug uh, in Europe and other regions. The most common side effects of this drug are gastrointestinal, including nausea, diarrhea, and abdominal discomfort. The most recently approved drug for ALS in the US is Tofersen. This was approved in 2023, but it's only approved for the treatment of ALS associated with genetic mutations in the SOD1 gene. And this affects about 2% of the total ALS population. Mutations in the SOD1 gene are thought to cause ALS to a, a toxic gain of function mechanism with accumulation of aggregates of mutant SOD1. The first one is an antisense oligonucleotide, so it directly targets uh, the, the disease in people who carry this mutation and uh, leads to a reduction in the accumulation of um, misfolded SOD1. The drug is administered via intrathecal injections and was approved in the US based on the um, accelerated approval mechanism uh, that um, where, where the, the results come from the phase three Valor trial. Uh, that was a trial um, in people with SOD1 ALS uh, that showed that treatment with Tofersen led to significant reduction in SOD1 protein in the CSF and also neurofilament levels in plasma. The, the drug was approved uh, based on these results. In the trial, there were trends for reduction in functional decline across multiple outcomes. There is an, another trial uh, of the first one that's currently ongoing. It's another phase three trial. It's called ATLAS that targets a different population. The ATLAS trial is going to test uh, the effect of the first one in adults with a confirmed SOD1 mutation. So these are SOD1 mutation carriers that do not have the disease yet. So the idea here 
is to um, to follow uh, people at risk, um, people who carry the SOD1 mutation, follow them over time, and provide the first and uh, the first signs of uh, biochemical signs of disease. Um, and, and so uh, that will tell us if we're able to have uh, greater effects when the uh, the drug is given at the very first signs of disease. Potentially, hopefully, we'll be able to even prevent the disease altogether. So as you uh, may imagine, this is an area uh, really of intense research. We have seen some great successes with the approval of these new drugs over the last year or so, but there's ob obviously more work to do. We still have to develop more treatments for ALS, and, and fortunately there are many research studies that are trying to develop new disease-modifying treatments for ALS. Now, researchers have identified a number of drug, drug targets, so there's, uh, there's a lot of research going on right now on the different molecular mechanisms of ALS, from axonal transport to um, growth factors, obviously lots of uh, research in genetics. Uh, there's um, research on mitochondria, ER stress, um, and, and other, uh, other mechanisms in the cell that are known to uh, lead to ALS or at least contribute to ALS, at least in vitro or in preclinical models. Many of these targets are potential drug targets, and so now there are many companies developing drugs around the world to affect these uh, potential targets, trying to improve outcomes for our patients. And uh, I would go uh, as far as saying that research, research is actually an important component of multidisciplinary care in ALS. When we think about caring for the person with ALS, we think about supportive care, symptom management, uh, prescription of the, of the drugs that are available that are FDA approved. But I will argue that being part of research is really um, meaningful for people with ALS, obviously it's optional, but many patients are telling us that being part of research and contributing to the development of new drugs is very meaningful and, and really provides them with hope. So right now, there are many research studies that are available, and I would like to emphasize that research studies are not only interventional drug trials, but also natural history studies, biomarker studies, and other studies that are trying to tell us more, teach us more about ALS. And it's only thanks to these studies, these foundational studies on natural history, biomarkers, and other aspects of the disease that we can then develop interventional drug trials. Now, the, uh, the research community is very active and very organized. In the US, uh, there's a few different groups uh, working on ALS, and I would like to, um, uh, to share that if you're interested in learning more about um, research consortia, uh, research studies, if you want to refer your patients to research studies or to specialized ALS clinics, I would recommend uh, that you look up the uh, NEILS consortium website, uh, NEILS.org, uh, and that's a consortium that includes over 140 sites in the U.S., uh, located in uh, many states, both uh, urban areas and rural areas, both academic centers, but also private practices that provide access to research and uh, uh, multidisciplinary care across the U.S. And this is a good place to start uh, to refer your patients uh, if they're interested in participating in research. And I uh, would like to say that there are also other consortia and other groups um, nationally and internationally, uh, and we collaborate with many of them so that we can all learn together. I would really um, suggest that you consider referring ALS patients to research centers if they're interested in these other aspects of multidisciplinary care. There are many studies that are currently underway in the US. I mentioned there's many natural history studies, biomarker studies. There's also a lot of interventional drug trials. In fact, we're seeing more drug trials now than ever in ALS. Uh, some of them are early phase, but many of them are also late stage, uh, meaning that the drugs that are being tested have already passed uh, some of the early phase testing, such as phase one or, or pure safety studies. And now we have a number of phase two or phase three studies that are um, enrolling uh, participants, including the Himalaya study. This is a, a phase two study to assess the uh, safety and efficacy 
of um, SAR 443820. Uh, we have the Cardinal study, another phase two study uh, uh, that's, um, that's designed to assess the uh, safety and efficacy of a different drug, PTC 857. And then we also have the Helia LS Graphon trial, a phase two, three study to assess the efficacy and sa safety of several drugs. And so far it has included seven different regimens or seven different drugs. And these are just some of the um, phase two slash three studies that are ongoing and currently um, underway in the US. Uh, and I expect many more studies to become available over the next few months. It's a very dynamic field. So going back to the patient that was presented earlier, patient Nancy. So uh, the patient was diagnosed with ALS, as discussed earlier. So what can we offer um, to this patient? Well, first of all, I would like to, uh, to again emphasize the importance of early referral to a multidisciplinary clinic for optimal supportive care. And that includes a number of specialties, a number of interventions uh, that are best initiated right away a diagnosis. Uh, this allows you know, the physician and the team to address many aspects of the disease, uh, including symptoms, secondary symptoms um, that can affect quality of life. And obviously, uh, importantly, um, th there is the need to monitor for respiratory function and nutritional status. But then Nancy and her physician also discussed the benefits and risks associated with uh, the disease-modifying treatments that are currently available uh, for ALS in the US and they are FDA approved. Now you may remember that Nancy tested negative for SOD1, so the first one is not an option in this case. However, the other three drugs that I described that are available for ALS, Rilusol, Indaravon, and, and PV Terso, they are approved for all forms of ALS. And so at this point, because we have a number of drugs available, it's good to have a discussion about uh, what treatment options can we select, uh, in what order, uh, and, and we can start maybe uh, with, uh, with Dr. Barry and I, we, uh, we can share our own thoughts in terms of how we initiate treatment. And, and personally, I was in ALS clinic earlier today, and, and that's exactly what I've done. With all the new patients that I diagnosed today, uh, I, I offered uh, treatment with all these three drugs, Riluzol, Edarvon, and Pimbiterso. And, and personally, I offer them as a cocktail uh, from the beginning, um, so from uh, very early, as soon as the diagnosis has been shared. Uh, and uh, because, again, they were uh, safely combined in the, in the trials that led to their approval. And so they all work through different mechanisms. And so I think it's reasonable to offer treatment with all of them from the very beginning. And as we continue to work on early diagnosis, I think you know we can go earlier and earlier, hopefully, uh, and offer these drugs um, you know as soon as possible after disease onset when we think they might might have the best chances of having an effect. And so with that, I would like to call back my colleague Dr. Barry and see what his thoughts are um, about starting these drugs. Yeah, Sabrina, thank you so much for walking us through that. It's it's um... It's amazing how much the landscape of treatment uh, with disease-modifying therapies, at least, has changed for ALS. Um, I, you know, I think um, as we've seen these most recent trials um, emerge with their data showing efficacy and slowing ALS for these new therapies, it's been a really exciting time to be an ALS physician. And it's been exciting for, for people with ALS, although it is very clear that we still have a long, long way to go to really uh, make a, an impact on this disease by by stopping it in its tracks. Um, because, you know, we have a lot of options, but, but you know, we haven't cured the disease. I, you know, my approach is really similar to yours to really discuss all of the, certainly the three drugs that are available for all people with ALS. Um, and then, you know, uh, tofersin, which is really targeting people specifically with SOD1 ALS. I would talk about all four with, with a SOD1 ALS patient. Um, I think for people who have uh, sporadic or non-SOD1 ALS, um, you know, I talk about all three of the therapies. I do, you know, take some time and try to go over the data um, that we have about each of the drugs, as well as, um, you know, both efficacy and safety and, and tolerability, um, because I think that does help people kind of make a decision about which ones to try or at least understand what, you know, what they may 
the you know what what symptoms they may experience as a result of sort of side effects from the drug. Uh, so I, you know that's that's my approach. Um, there are lots of practical considerations that that come into play that sort of guide people to you know taking one, two, or three of those drugs, or even all four if they have salmonella. Great. So I. I'll share how I sequence them, um, and then maybe you can um, you can share your thoughts. Um, so there's again for for people who do not have a mutation in the SOD1 gene, there are three drugs that are available. Personally, again, I uh, in a completely like review, I I discuss uh, the trial data as well as uh, potential side effects and and considerations for treatment. Uh, and then if if people are, are are interested in in trying the drugs, I personally prescribe all three of them um, essentially on day one. In fact, I did it today. Uh, you know, as soon as somebody was diagnosed, I provided the three prescriptions. Uh, practically speaking, Riluzol has been approved for a long time, uh, since the 90s. It is now generic. It's fairly easy to get. It's fairly easy to prescribe. And so, uh, you know, and the, the patient will start the, the, the prescription right away. Um, and it's easy to, again, uh, to initiate that right away. Uh, I do uh, monitor liver function tests for the first uh, three months every month. And so that's important for the patient to be on board with that. And then in terms of the the new drugs, um, uh, I no longer prescribe intravenous Edaravon. Uh, I personally prescribe oral Edaravon to everyone who's interested in starting Edaravon because it's just easier to take. Uh, and so I prescribe I generally prescribe that again on day one as well as uh, PB Terso on day one. Because these are newer medications, oral Edaravon was approved in 2022 uh, and uh, PB Terso also was approved in 2022. So we still have to go through um, obviously um, uh, pre-authorization processes that are fairly common in medicine for newly approved drugs. And so that may take some time. Uh, and the co-payment uh, or cost to the patient may vary depending on the specific insurance carrier. So there are ways to support our patients through all of this, but basically what I do is I start the prescription or the process on day one, and then as um, you know, the process is cleared by insurance companies, then the patients can start taking these medications. Uh, I never like, in general, in medicine, I don't like to start three drugs on the same day anyway, so for me, the fact that they are sequenced anyway for logistical reasons, in a way, is good because I, you know, I want to make sure that I monitor for potential side effects, and um, uh, I want to be able to tell, uh, uh, you know, which drug causes which side effect, if any. And so the sequence actually works well um, in my experience. So I don't know what your thoughts are. Yeah, no, I, I've had the same thoughts. You know, it's sort of they're sequenced for us in a way by practicalities right now. You know, I have thought a little bit about what what would we do in in a world where we didn't have insurance prior authorizations that w that are sort of spreading out these drugs. And you know, one of the things that's that um, is really different than other areas, like for example, multiple sclerosis, is that all of these drugs hit different pathways. So we really can use them together, and they're not they're not sort of just hitting the same pathway more and more with all the same, you know, effects, but also all the same side effects. They're really hitting different pathways, and they have fairly different side effect profiles. And I think we're lucky in that they're they're fairly benign. So really, a different different landscape than sort of MS, where you have to go sequentially. Um, but I agree that starting three drugs on the same day may be a little bit, um, you know, a little bit inadvisable. So you know, maybe we would spread them out, you know, by a week or two. Um, you know, um, really, as all, we sometimes see people have a little bit of nausea. And we have to keep an eye on those liver enzymes every month for three months and every three months thereafter. Um, although, you know, significant LFT increases are, are reversible and not really that common, we, we, we certainly need to keep an eye on it. The other two drugs really don't need lab monitoring. Um, and um, Adaravone has very few side effects. You know, you, you listed those, but as far as sort of symptoms, you know, very few side effects. Um, and uh, PB Terso uh, can come with some GI upset. It tends to be kind of you know lower GI and abdominal discomfort. And and um, you know we actually started a lower dose with that drug 
for a couple of weeks, once a day, and then we moved to twice a day after two weeks to try to mitigate that. And it, it, it does help with a, a lot for a lot of patients. So it's not like combining them would introduce some you know, major you know, uh, side effect that, that we have to, you know, be very cautious about safety for. It's more a matter of just tolerability. So that's, that's, you know, comforting. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, that's such a great point. And in fact, I, going back to the trials that led to the approval of these drugs, as I said earlier, the Edaravon trial was done on a background of participants who all took Riluzol. So it was really an add-on um, trial in a way. The trial of pibitursil did not require participants to be on Riluzol or Edaravon, but the reality is that the majority of participants were at least on one of them, if not two of them. And so, um, again, it, it was combined. The three drugs were combined, essentially, in previous trials. And in those trials, at least, there were no safety concerns. And, in fact, I, I haven't seen them in my practice either. Uh, so, obviously, a different question is what's going to be the real-world um, impact of this combination. You know, I, I can say that right now, um, most of my patients are on triple cocktail, in fact, uh, and obviously time will tell uh, what the real world effect is of, 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 you know, prescribing three drugs instead of one like we used to until very recently. Um, and, and I will say, again, for all the reasons that we discussed, different mechanism of action, um, trial data being available, ability to safely combine the drugs, personally, given that ALS is a fatal medication, I think, you know, it's, you know, it's reasonable um, to prescribe the cocktail. Uh, and hopefully, over time, we'll accumulate data, and I'm sure there will be real-world evidence studies that will tell us more about the real-world impact of the combination. Yeah. I, I think, you know, one of the things that I've been thinking about, and I think a lot of, a lot of us has, have been thinking about, is, is how different our first visit is with uh, people when we're diagnosing them with ALS at this point than it used to be. And which is wonderful because we're presenting now a number of, of treatment options, a number of treatment options that can be used together. We're also talking about uh, genetic testing and that impacts a potentially a, a fourth uh, a medication that, that could be introduced. It's a lot of information to, to sort of get through with people in, in one visit. We do want to start these things as early as possible, but you know, it just shows how much this is, you know, the, the landscape has changed. And because we think these drugs work earlier, you know, it really does mean that we'd like to meet with patients earlier in clinic. We'd like to have these conversations as early as possible, and we want them to be able to sort of digest that information quickly and, and uh, get onto the treatments that can, that can slow their disease. It's true. That the, yeah, the, the rapidity of, you know, the way the field is changing is really fantastic. In fact, I would not be surprised if, you know, if we did this uh, video again in one year, perhaps we will have another drug. So hopefully everyone can stay tuned uh, and really stay in touch with the research community because I think there's lots more to see very soon. Thanks very much, Sabrina. And, and thank you all for joining us. Um, this has been a wonderful dialogue um, and we hope that you've enjoyed the presentation thank you again for joining us thank you to peer review for uh hosting this uh and sabrina paganoni thank you for joining me today in the presentation phenotypic and genetic variations among patients with als indicate that multiple disease mechanisms are involved in the development and progression of the disease RIPK1 is a signaling protein in the tumor necrosis factor receptor pathway that regulates inflammation and cell death. In patients with ALS, increased RIPK1 activity in the brain drives neuroinflammation and cell necroptosis and contributes to neurodegeneration. SAR443820 is an investigational CNS penetrant small molecule that inhibits RIPK1 mediated inflammation and necroptosis of motor neurons. Chronic activation of the neuronal integrated stress response suppresses the activity of eukaryotic initiation factor 2b, leading to impaired protein synthesis and the formation of stress granules, which are precursors to TDP43 aggregates. DNL343 is a small molecule designed to activate EIF2b, which restores protein synthesis, disperses stress granules and TDP43 aggregates in the cytoplasm and improves neuronal survival.
CNM AU8 is a suspension of clean-surfaced, catalytically active gold nanocrystals that has shown neuroprotective activity through the catalysis of NADH oxidation to NAD, which increases ATP production, restores energy to brain cells, and promotes the dispersal of TDP43 aggregates in the cytoplasm. Mutations in the gene encoding SOD1 are associated with up to 2% of all cases of ALS. Disease expression is mediated by a toxic gain-of-function mechanism associated with the aggregation of the misfolded SOD1 protein. Tofersin is an antisense oligonucleotide that mediates RNA's H-dependent degradation of SOD1 messenger RNA, reducing mutant SOD1 protein synthesis. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash FCQ 860. This activity is supported by educational grants from Amelix Pharmaceuticals Incorporated and Sanofi. This activity is certified by PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education. Remember to download the slides and practice aids.